Hi, everybody. Welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writer's podcast. I'm your host, Ruben Mendive. Today, we have a brand new guest. So I like to start my interviews by having my guests introduce themselves. So your name and how you identify for the people at home. Hi, my name is Elvia Susana Rubalcaba. I use um, she, hers, ella. And I'm a Chicana, born and raised from Santa Ana, California. And so you led me to my follow-up question. I like to ask my guess where they're from. So what's the short version? What's the long version? The short version is, you know, I'm from Santana, part of Orange County. I moved around a lot, but I just recently came back about seven months ago back to uh, my hometown. Um, but I like to say that I was conceived in El Paso, Texas, which where is where my family is from. And, um, but that's not true. Like I was, uh, my family moved out a couple of years before I was born. Um, there's six of us, and the two youngest, me and my younger brother, were born um, in Orange County. Where, what's your parents' story? Like, where are they from? What's their journey? How did, how did they come to, like, create you? So, my mom, uh, Gloria Margarita Guevara Rubalcaba, um, was born in Ciudad Juarez in, um, in Mexico. And she moved out here, or moved to the States, um, when she was five years old. My grandmother, Agustina Guevara, um, her and her husband, Santiago um, she wanted um, more for her family and knew that, you know, there was future jo- um, a more um, jobs available. And and she had like 17 kids, my grandmother. <laughs> and so she was um, when my mom. So my mom grew up with um, a lot of her nieces and nephews, basically being her brothers and sisters, because she's like the youngest. But my grandmother was determined to move out here to the States. Um, Before she would help my grandfather, he would work in the daytime across the border to work in the gardens. He was a gardener. And then he'd cross back to the board, back to Juarez and sing in the cantinas. He was uh, a singer. And so he would work at the bars and the soldiers from the United States would come over and get drunk and, and party down here. But I really love that story of my grandparents because the way they would cross the border, they would allow women cross to cross the border if they had money to buy something from El Paso from the market. And so my grandfather would cross the um, the Rio Grande and meet her and she would take dry clothes to him. And that's how he would go to work every day. You know, my grandmother probably got tired of it and said, like, I'm determined to move. And she took care of all the paperwork. And so my, um, my mother grew up in El Paso and um, in the Segundo Barrio along with my my dad also grew up in the Segundo Barrio. He was born in El Paso and they met in childhood and they knew of each other, but they didn't reconnect until it was like a party, a New Year's Eve party. And they connected and started dating and got married. Yeah. And so what brought them over to like Southern California? They lived out in El Paso. They had four four kids there. And my dad, he was, he was really into ath- um, athletics. He was a bookworm a really all around um, student and he wanted to go to college, but he worked to help support his family. And then he realized like when the kids were young, if they were ever going to get out of um, poverty, that he had to go back to school. And so he went to the University of Texas El Paso and got his um, electrical engineering degree. And he applied for multiple jobs. One of them was in Dallas and the other one was in um, Newport Beach, California with the Ford Aerospace. And my mom wanted us out of Texas. She knew, again, just similar to like my grandmother, of wanting more for us and getting us out of Texas and over here to California. So they moved everyone out and we, they moved to um, Orange County. They checked out a couple of cities, but it was when they were driving by Santana that um, my siblings, I guess, were in the car and they said, Mom, Mom, um, there's people that look like us. There's people that look like us. And they were in Santana. So they decided to settle here and bought a home and um, started their family here. So he got a job as an aerospace en- um, engineer. The popular version is like the OC, that TV show, the Beverly, the Real Housewives of Orange County. That is the popular conception we right. have of Orange County. So like, what's like your world? Like, what is the other side of Orange County that we don't know about? 
Yeah, I remember those shows came out when I was in high school, and I'm like, what Orange County are they talking about? But I knew some parts because, again, my dad, you know, I grew up, um, although my siblings, you know, they grew up um, when my parents were still struggling and young. My younger brother and I, when we came around, we were pretty much in a, uh, a middle class, upper middle class family, you know. And so my dad really pushed to take us out, um, although we went to all public schools um, in Santa Ana. On Sundays, we would spend the whole day together, you know, going to Misa and then taking us out for breakfast. He would take us out to the movies, but he would take us to Irvine and Newport Beach and just really get us out of our bubble. And he would um, have us try different cuisines and he, we would spend like... Sunday evenings or afternoons watching like one or two movies and he would um, he'd want us to talk about them like analyze them and think about the direction and all of these things but he really tried to so I was familiar with um, what people outside of Orange County thought of the OC you know like beaches and stuff but the everyday Orange County that I grew up with you know, was comunidad, was um, neighbors helping neighbors. And um, our neighborhood was at the tail end of like white flight. And we had a kind of a diverse neighborhood growing up. But then it, you know, there was by high school, it was predominantly all Latino. You know, I definitely grew up with a vecina calling my mom. Hey, do you know where Susana? You know, I grew up with um, my middle name. Um, it's back there, you know, she's up, you know, up to this or when I got home, she, my mom knew everything that I was doing. Our neighborhood church of Our Lady Guadalupe was down the street. We were all catechist teachers. Um, they were very involved in the church. So I grew up with a lot. Although all my relatives were in El Paso, I didn't lose the closeness of what growing up Latino, Latina was like. And this is like 14 to 18. So who are you? Who are you to pretending to be? And how do other people see you? Gosh, I'm almost the same person that I am today. Like, I feel like people definitely saw I was a lot more introverted in elementary and junior high. I started getting to student government and the newspaper in junior high and started opening up a little bit more. But I've always seen myself as an introverted extrovert. You know, I, I've always been kind of friendly and getting along with everybody you know, again, involved with student government. I was a big um, American, you know, Chicana, Mexican-American, like really believed in. I was a history buff. I read a lot of about politics and things. But yeah, I was definitely nerdy, hung around other nerds, but definitely had all types of friends. I've always been in love with books. I grew up with um, reading. Uh, my dad always had my parents always had a library. My mom would always read to us or, or tell us stories. And so I definitely have always been a writer and really into English, my English classes. I guess what a lot of people saw too, though, was sometimes just a loner or just observing a lot. And um, But it was a really like mix of also being the extrovert, speaking out um, for myself or if I saw injustice, even in high school. There was a moment when our one of our English teachers had an affair with a student and our honors classes had emerged together. And our um, I was a junior in honors and the senior APs. They were really upset because um, regular seniors and honors um, juniors were going to read the same book as they were, 1984. And I remember we had a discussion about it with our um our honors English teacher who had to take over the AP class. And I just remember um, speaking up and being like, you guys are totally missing the point of the book if you think that only you should be allowed to read 1984. So although I was kind of introverted, it was always really important to me to speak out when necessary. And sometimes in the face of Although I, I, I had a beautiful childhood, my high school years was also really hard because my parents were going through really, not a bad divorce, like it was like towards the end of their marriage. And I finally had to speak up and just be like, you know, um, speak up about what was going on at home. Because it was the same thing in my family. We were very outgoing, very involved in our church, but at the same time, things weren't perfect at home. You know, we don't talk about those things. We 
we keep them inside. So it was high school was definitely a struggle of writing a lot to deal with all those emotions. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did you do after high school? I secretly applied to away schools behind my dad's back because my dad had he had six they had six kids. So his plan was you go to a junior college and then you transfer because how was he going to pay for you know everybody to go to school? Um, but again, it was um, a really hard family life and I needed to get away. So I applied to Cotty College, which is was in Missouri, and I didn't get an acceptance letter. I got a phone call. I think I was going to be their only person of color. And <laughs> they're like, you know, we want you. We want you to apply for all this financial aid. And um, when I told my mom that I was leaving and it was just going to be her and my younger, my dad and my younger brother, she finally realized um, that. Um, she wanted to divorce my father. So I declined those offers and I ended up going to Santa Ana College and I registered. My sister took me. I registered like the day before. So I took classes like ethics and political science and all these um, hard classes that a freshman normally wouldn't take. But because my mom finally agreed to divorce my dad, I had to stick around to help her with my younger brother and also help her with um, the divorce. Like, what was the plan? Because you're going to college now. Like, did you have like a, like, did you know what you wanted to pursue professionally? I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I mean, I've had my, my diary since I, you know, was little. I have some of them um, behind me. But again, I, you know, my dad was really, um, when I would bring it up, he'd be like, no, 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 you do that. That's a hobby. You do that on your own time open up a newspaper, see what jobs people are hiring for. You know, he wanted us to be lawyers, doctors, engineers. And so I was going into um, law. I My degree is actually in legal studies from Chapman University. But, you know, when they separated, it felt like, you know, a new freedom to decide what I wanted to do. But those pressures were kind of still on me. So I was still pursuing political science and and history and um, legal studies, but I was good at it. You know, I enjoyed it. I read a lot of nonfiction. I read a lot of um, the civil rights movement really interested me. So, and then having to take all those classes that I did my first semester, it even pushed me more to that um, field. So I always thought I was gonna be a lawyer when I grew up, yeah. So can you describe your time at Chapman? Like, why did you decide to go there? Like, what do you think you got out of that experience? Yeah, so I went to, like I mentioned, I went to Santa Ana College, and I um, I got involved with student government again, and I met a wonderful friend. Um, her name is um, Dr. Um, Ayolabi, actually, today is her birthday, but she was involved with the Black Student Union, and she was the one that invited me and introduced me to Mecha at Santa Ana College, and um, we got really pol- politically involved um, during those years. And we met a uh, professor, Dr. Will, um, um, who passed away a few years ago from Chapman University. And he pushed her to apply. And so I went to go check out the campus because I was applying for like USC and Mills, um, a women's college. I was really into women's colleges, but Chapman offered me the most money and it was still local where I can kind of keep an eye on my family. Uh, it was definitely a culture shock, you know, going from Santa Ana College, which was predominantly Latino um, people of color to where it was not only just uh, majority white, but rich, uh, rich white. I, our first day of orientation, we both um, started the same year and we noticed there wasn't a black student union table, you know, out in orientation with all the other clubs. So we went to the student activities and we're all like, can we put a table up? We're going to start a BSU. And, and so we did that and we organized a BSU. It hadn't been around. There was a handful of black um, students. I think the year I went in, there was only one black uh, freshman. And then eventually I met other Latinos, uh, Mexicanos, Chicanos, and got involved with Mecha. And we became sister clubs with BSU. But Chapman was definitely where um, my activism really exploded. I was active at Santa Ana College, but I mean, Chapman definitely exploded that, um, that fire within me as an, as an activist. 
You know, I am curious about Mecha just because I don't think we have that in Chicago. I, I've only heard of it like casually and like when people are like championing it or talking crap about it. Can you just explain to the audience and me like what is it? Like where did it come from? Like what 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 does it do? It's Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. Um, San Ana College version was very different. Like, again, the my first experience with them was going to a statewide conference, and it was just um, a bunch of speakers and different things. And then at Chapman, it was a smaller group, and we really melded it to, um, to us. But for me, and I, I became the president at one year, but for me, it was just really important so it's, a, a, you know, a political student organization and um, they would do conferences and workshops or um, they would bring in high school students to come and visit the campuses. Um, they would speak out on issues not just in concerning um, students, but in their communities and neighborhoods. It was a national organization. So sometimes, you know, they would get together. But for us, um, it was always really important for me to, because it was just a shock when I first went to Chapman and I have older siblings that all went to college, I still felt like it wasn't a place for me. It wasn't like they were going to tell me, sorry, we changed our mind. I felt like I didn't belong. And so it was really important to me after being there um, of not letting freshmen, not just Chicano Latinos, but um, students of color not feel like they don't belong there. So it was really um, having our own type of orientation, mentorship, you know, giving them books um, to read, um, making sure that they knew, especially if they were living on campus, that they knew that someone was there. We used to have like this thing called like the brown table. <laughs> and it usually was like one or two tables because there wasn't that many of us. But, you know, some of us were struggling. Some of us were, you know, carpooling to campus. And, you know, we'd share our lunches together, we'd study together, we made sure no one was left behind or thought of dropping out. Um, so it was a lot more, um, like we didn't do the normal things that a typical Mecha would do. You know, we, it was definitely very, because there was so few of us, we, it, it tightened our, um, our community even more. And we had wonderful mentors, uh, Dr. Paul Apodaca, and a number of professors, a handful of professors that um, really helped um, guide us during that time. Dr. Young, who is part of um, the Black Student Union, you know, she helped guide a lot of Mecha students, a lot of Chicano Latino students as well. What did you do after college? Like, did you have a plan? Did things go according to plan? Um, I was supposed to go to graduate school after taking a year break. And all my professors said, no, 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 just go straight, go straight, because you won't go back. And damn it, they're right. <laughs> I didn't go back. You know what? I at the end, I was very again politically involved. I had like one woman protests. You know, you know, on campus, there was a lot of you know uh, controversies. You know, uh, with me speaking out. But um, I I got my degree in legal studies with emphasis on political science and peace studies. But by the end, I was also working a couple of jobs at the same time. I remember my graduation day just crying because I was so exhausted. I was just burnt out. And the thought of going straight into another program just, you know, I didn't want to do that. I always wanted, I knew I always wanted to work um, for like a Latino organization and I wanted to come back and work in Santana. I loved my city. But every job since college has taken me out of Santana. So I didn't, I didn't go straight. I didn't pursue law school, I worked for, um, I got a job with the Puente Project w through the UC system. And it was being a, a community uh, mentor liaison, was recruiting mentors for high school students um, in the Anaheim School District. And that was wonderful. I did that for a couple of years. I worked independently. You know, I would fly up to Oak to Berkeley to meet with my bosses and stuff. So um, I really enjoyed that it helped me really be independent and it also got me to travel and take all sorts of workshops in developing um, doing community activism um, and then from there I worked with Orange County Human Relations as a community um, um, leader also organizer and I worked in Fullerton and that's how I got introduced with the city of Fullerton and the communities there it was training um, grassroots leaders on how to um, speak up, how to um, be, make sure that they're part of the 
decisions um, that were happening with the city. They had bridging the communication between the police department. So it was just being, again, a liaison with the school district, organization, businesses, but particularly the police department. The year before, they had received an award for their community policing, but they had so many problems with the city. I really, it was the field that I really wanted to get into, and I loved it. I did it for many years, community organizing, but um, I'm a bleeding heart, and I got really invested in the community, and and there's some families that I'm still friends with. Um, I've seen their kids grow up, and they're now having their own families, and have gone off to college, but um, I, def- I was starting to burn out a little bit. But um, unfortunately, you know, 9-11 happened, like a lot of nonprofits. Um, I was laid off um, after that job. It really threw me for a loop because I I was doing what I loved and I couldn't believe that I was, you know, laid off. And then everything, of course, that was happening, you know, um, kind of like right now with COVID of what was happening with 9-11. So you know, I got into a little bit of a depression and it it was hard to get my footing back. But because of the work that I did with Fullerton, um, the Parks and Recreation Director um, hired me to be a consultant. And then I eventually worked for the city of Fullerton um, doing work for them. Um, I, no, I'm just thinking, like, get you one of those good government jobs, you know? That was the plan. <laughs> and then I got laid off again after COVID. <laughs> I've been laid off three times for... Um, I've, I've had a, a really rich, complex life. So I'm giving you like the, the, the mini version, even, yeah. <laughs> even though it's, it's full. But yeah, sadly, um, I, my last position, because I've, I've worked my way to different things with the city, um, the director of the time at the museum heard about me and I interviewed for a job and she didn't give it to me. And she said, I didn't give it to you because I think you'd be really great at the museum. You're creative. I had mentioned that I was a writer and I worked in theater. So I worked for the Fullerton Museum Center um, for almost six years. But unfortunately, the first things to go when we're in a financial crisis are the arts. So um, for now, the museum's shut down. So like, when did the writing come in for you? Like, is it something you had a childhood? And like, where was, when did it turn into something you're like, okay, this is something that I do now? Always been really interested in writing. But again, books, you know, I was always a, a reader first. I, I come from a family of storytellers. Um, but my dad used to take us to the Santa Ana Library. They used to have this really great children's library in an outdoor area. He would take me and my younger brother. Um, he was always really busy and worked really late. But I really appreciated those moments where he would take us there and we'd pick the books and I missed the smell of library books. I loved how stories transported you and how and how some of them were really personal. And then when I started, you know, in elementary school where they having you start writing essays and paragraphs, it felt freeing. I was always, I've always been the type of person that's I get it in my head a lot and I I write a lot in my head and then I have to really make myself <laughs> put it down on paper. But again, the loner kid in elementary school, you know, I've always been a chubby person. And so I was picked on a lot in elementary school. And so I spent a lot of time by myself and I used to talk to baby Jesus. <laughs> I used to write my, my diary, I would call it dear book. So, but they were like persons that I would speak to, but Writing definitely, I feel like, saved my life, especially with all the the turmoil in our home environment where we couldn't share what was happening. I, I wrote a lot in those diaries. I, I, I wrote a lot in my journals. And when I couldn't draw, I would, I mean, when I couldn't write, I would draw. And so I just kept developing it. And then just slowly English teachers would pull me aside and, you know, I would get stuff published or I was involved with the newspaper and I would write articles. In college, you know, history, political science professors, they, they'd talk about my essays, how they were poetic. And this is like on stuff about history, you know, and not that I would write a poem, but, you know, it was always a lot of positive, you know, um, comments about my writing and so I, I had a blog in college and it was it was private. I was always kind of like a private writer and I, I would write poetry and I would, you know, do little things. But it wasn't until about, I don't know, 10, uh, like 11, 12 years ago where I started being more public about my writing. My sister, who's also a fellow writer, um, Sylvia Chavez, 
um, we, she really pushed um, my writing as an adult. Um, we both were writer, our writers, and we used to go to um, um, a couple of Riverside open mic nights together. And she never, although I, you know, we started going on um, with a friendster in MySpace and sharing our lives. That was kind of new back then. And so she was very private, and so we, we'd be our secret um, writer friend. And um, we'd go to faraway places because we were still not confident about our writing. Um, so we would have all these adventures. We would go to a lot of workshops. She was the first one to, we both took a Casa 0101 workshop with Josefina Lopez when she was at a conference. Um, she's an engineer. She was at a conference in LA and she invited me. She's like, let's do a writer's retreat. You know, when I'm not in the conference, we could write together. And then we found Casa and she t we both took the workshop. And um, she continued with them and was first involved with Chicanas, Cholas, and Chisme. And then I got involved um, the second year. But before that, we also took um, Sarah uh, Rafael Garcia, um, who does Libro Mobile in Santana. She used to teach a class called um, Wild Women Writers. And so that was our first kind of workshop together that we would take and we would meet once a week with a handful of women. And also she was a good push of just like, you know, you, you write really metaphorically and you, you know, she was really positive about my writing. And she's like, not a lot of people can do that. Cause I was just like, I've always been kind of like, oh, you know, it's just a little thing. I've have, I've had all that experience writing and developing my poetry. I've, I've always felt like I've, you know, my poetry is my first love. It's the way I communicate. It's the way I, I process things in writing. Um, short stories and poems. And then I got into playwriting about seven years ago. Um, but I got involved with theater with Breath of Fire Latina Theater Ensemble in Santana. I, you know, all I did was take political science classes in college, and I never was able to take Chicano studies classes or creative writing classes. So I took a year at Fullerton College, and I took every Chicano class that they had, every creative writing class that they had, I, I did a full, like a full-time um, student load while working a full-time job. And I got straight A's, be but because I loved it. I, mm -hmm. I was taking class that I really loved. And that's where I took a playwriting class and really got into um, playwriting. Because that's how you sort of got on my radar, was with Chicanas, Cholas, and Chisme. And it's, it's a play festival. It's a yearly play festival, I believe, at Casa 0101. We're just a bunch of like badass Chicanas who write 10 minute like sh short plays and you all put up a show. And I went to see it, I think, I think it was last year because I, I had just gotten introduced to the Boyle Heights theater scene and Casa. Yeah. And, and I was I was talking to this to someone about this recently where it was like, I didn't even know it ex this, it, this like little yeah. gem existed. So when I sort of tripped into it, I immediately became obsessed with everyone there. And you, I would say you're one of the pillars of it. And because here's the thing, you're a writer, but also you're like hustling and you're making sure that things are getting produced. And that is the part of writing no one tells you about. So I want to talk about Gigana Estrella and Cheesement first. Like, like, how did it turn from you sort of joining to then sort of like being one of the, like the figureheads of it? Again, my sister brought me in. I, I saw her show, um, the show, and it sold out. And I was just blown away. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know, because I was like the Chicana, like my dad, you know, brought us up as uh, Mexican-American Chicanos, but more that a cultural, not really the political part. And so um, I just fell hard. And so after coming from the class, my playwriting class, and with, I wrote Sala de Amor Higuera, I, I met with the producers and I got involved with these women. And I loved it because we're all you know, we all have our careers, we're all, you know, they were all a mix of graduate students and all sorts of women that, you know, would stay up late and create their own thing. And I love what CCC has done, um, what Josefina Lopez, Lindsay Haley and Claudia Duran, um, the original producers of CCC, of creating like, you know, to teach you not only to have a place for your writing and, you know, developing your work, but for those that are interested in directing, you know, so I directed for the first time in my life through them. And then also producing your show. It's not enough. No one's going to put your work out there for you. You have to, um, you have to hustle your work. And I learned that from them. But I also learned that from, you know, I have, um, I have a couple of other friends who are writers like um, Gustavo Ariano, you know, 
I remember having, you know, several conversations with him. We went to Chapman together. And so um, when, you know, he was blowing up, he's like, you have to hustle. You have to be your own um, person that puts yourself out there. And so I really learned, I I did that with CCC um, of really like, how do I, we highlight these stories? How do we sell out every year? How do we honor the work and make them the rock stars of the community? You know, so it was really important for me. Um, my dad, you know, he got me into graphic arts and stuff like that. So although I was a writer, director, and a assistant producer for CCC, I did a lot of their social media and their graphics. And I really wanted to highlight the writers that were coming out of there. I love that we've we, this is our ninth year. Unfortunately, we didn't get to do a new season. Um, we only were able to do a few weeks of our eighth season. But I love that all the mujeres, all the all the artists that have come from there, are now doing producing their own shows with Teatro Frida Kahlo, with um, Short and Sweet Hollywood, with making their own short films. They're doing so much out there. But I feel like like for me, I can't speak for everybody. But definitely CCC and CASA helped lay that foundation for us. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. And it was last year that I ended up becoming a producer and really wanted to um, help spearhead, like, where's CCC going in the future? And what's going to happen? Well, the future kind of went in March, right, <laughs> last year. But it was really important for the other producer and I, um, Claudia Duran, of to do a podcast to still reach out to not just the artists, um, the other CCCers, but our community. So um, we're working on an anthology or we have a podcast and we're seeing how we love the success of the Teatro Frida Kahlo Festival, virtual um, festival. So we're seeing how we could adapt CCC for that. But it's really, and it's been kind of a little bit of a slow process because again, everyone's blowing up in all these other areas. And I love my time with CCC and what I've been able to, what we've been able to accomplish together. But now I'm also bringing in like what I learned from that. How can I apply it to, to um, really develop myself as an artist and producing and directing and pushing my own work and my own voice. So that's the next step, the next level that I'm working on. And, you know, I told a friend recently, you know, you have to produce just as hard as you write and direct. Um, And I'm really grateful for my experience also as a director because I feel like it's helped my writing um, tremendously, not just in playwriting, but in my writing of um, short stories and poetry as well. Yes, and I think that's what something that Gasa does very well. It's a breeding ground for artists. It is somewhat, you can walk off the street, not know any, how to write anything, but I think Josefina truly believes that everyone's got a story and it's just whether they're ready to tell it or not. And you could just be like that and they'll be like, okay, we'll teach you how to write. Here's a way for you to like immediately, how do we get you to start um, writing, producing, directing? And, you know, these are all like incredible women. Like the show is always selling out. It's amazing. Like, and it just becomes this place where sort of like you can get your training wheels for artistry and being an artist and writer and, and theater maker. And then it's like, okay. And then now you have all the tools and it's, Perfect. And I think that's what I love the most about CCC. It's like the sense of community, like you're all really rooting for each other, working together. That's something that we as like Latinx folks are very like desperate for and especially in the arts. And it's so like Casa and CCC is such a great home for so many like emerging playwrights. Yeah, definitely. Casa has truly been another home for me. Boyle Heights, you know, I have a special, you know, place in my heart for it. But there was this one time, it was like right before a show that, you know, CCC was, you know, we were right close to tech. And then um, they were working on the Beauty and the Beast in one part of Casa. Um, And so, and then there was another group, I think it was brought in out, they were having a meeting. And I did a little video from like the staff office to where the staff, they're working really hard, getting everything together. And I remember just scanning and just going to each group And it just felt like home, you know, Mm -hmm. it felt like, you know, a typical Latino home where everyone's home to visit, everyone's working on their projects and you can have big dreams. You can have your own play, but you got to put in the hustle. You got to put in the work yourself too. No one's going to do it for you and you really need to, um, but they're there to help mentor you. They're there to help guide you, but you got to, you got to put the fire. Yeah. And, and that was similar story for me. Like I was a stranger fully off the street. 
and now I feel like I'm such part of this like incredible community where you're just excited to see what everyone's making. So with that, I did want to talk about Breath of Fire. It's come up on the podcast, but I don't think we've done a deep dive into it and I'm Mm -hmm. low key obsessed with it. So like, can you sort of explain what it is and what y'all do? I was involved with them um, years ago. I I took, uh, I'm obsessed and I love uh, um, Sherry Moraga and um, her work. And her and Adelinta, Adelina um, Anthony did a workshop to help fundraise a play that Breath of Fire was producing called Digging Up the Dirt. And um, I took that workshop and it just like blew my mind. It was the first um I think it was the first workshop I took with um, Shere Moraga. Um, I'm definitely one of her stalkers. I've taken, uh, you know, a lot of workshops with her. But um, I saw the play. I was just, I loved it. Um, the artistic director, I went to high school with her, Sarah Guerrero. And so at the closing party that was at a fr- our friend's house, um, Rigo Maldonado, she like cornered me. This is a funny story because um, at one of the shows, she kind of <laughs> cornered me. I was like, we were in the ladies room and she's just like, hey, how would you like to get involved with the board? And how would you like not only be part of the board, how would you like to be the board president? And um, so that's how I got involved. I was involved with them for five years. Um, I'm no longer part of the ensemble, but I um, I do work with them. We do collaborate, especially with CCC. We're trying to have like this sister, this connection to um, we've had a couple of um, events where we both um, have collaborated and did some work together. Um, I'm working with um, their current president, Angela Estela, who you've had on your show. We're going to be teaching uh, Rio de Mi Vida um, writing class creative writing class starting this saturday you know in february in the month of february with um breath of fire so i'm I'm still involved but um they do amazing work right now they have um covid monologues i just watched them please um support them there's they're doing another um series so they're still accepting work about um pieces monologues about um individuals who have died from covid but they do amazing work. They're another group of, you know, Latinas, um, not just Latinas. They have opened um, their space for men and different um, um, people from all walks, as long as their work supports or highlights Latinas. Um, but I'm really proud of the work that they do in Santana. I'm hoping to get, now that I live here, um, involved with them. But really wonderful storytellers and also um, really great um, hustlers. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and speaking of the hustle, I also saw that you were part of the Frida Kahlo um, Theater Festival this year, and, and it's all digital in the time of Corona. Yeah. So um, I've actually seen the first half because you always do two parts. I've seen yeah. the first part and I was nervous because it's like Zoom theater. Here we go. Like, yeah, what is it going to be? And I will say y'all have been the only people that have impressed me. Like I was oh, like, thank you. I, I saw the show and I was like, this is how they sh- everyone should be doing it. Yeah. Like it is because it's a mix of short films. It is a mix of like, like recorded live theater. It is a mix of Zoom rooms and, and it all works. And I, and listen, I've seen a lot of Zoom shows. Yeah. I haven't seen what does successfully till I watched yours. And I was like, oh, this is like a masterclass in how to do like storytelling virtually. So like, yeah. what was the journey of like being like, do we still do this? How, yes how do we figure it out yeah um i'm so grateful for this festival this is i think my fourth year involved and i we submitted pieces and we thought you know hey we'll be safe and the theater will open up again and we'll do this but when it started going you know that we would have to do it virtually you know we ruben um Amaviska was has been really great what's great about this festival is like, it's basically on your own. You gotta, you gotta put it together. You're produ- your own production company and you have to do it. And I remember when he brought it up that he's like, ah, Zoom theater is, you know, boring. I'm just, you know, try and get it, you know, taped, you know, work with your actors. And I was just like, I'm going to prove you wrong. You know, because at the time when I did, I, I wrote and directed um, A Paz Girl and then I directed um, El Arroyo, which is set in the 1920s. Like, how am I going to do this? You know? And, you know, I wanted to be safe, you know, from from being exposed and I wanted to make sure my actors were safe. So those um, Apaz Girl was definitely no contact theater. You know, we did it all through Zoom. 
And then El Arroyo, um, we did film um, a couple of outdoor scenes, but it was just with one actor and one film person. And then I, you know, um, the writer and me as the director were far from them. I was just up for the challenge. You know, I wanted to prove, not that I wanted to prove Ruben wrong. I love him. I wanted to prove to myself being like, you know, this is a unique situation. I wanted from 20 years from now, 10 years from now to be like, I had to create this because of the situation we were in. And um, I was up for the challenge. I took a workshop um, by Marcos Najera, I believe, through the Latino um, Theater Alliance a few months um, back. And he did a workshop on how to use Zoom in theater, you know? And so we were like, he was jumping on couches and he was crouching and he was teaching us how to, you know, um, play with props and do a number of things. So with that, I did a lot of research on YouTube. I watched a lot of, you know, shows, theater shows to see like what to do, what not to do. And then I brought in a team. I don't have all the answers and I don't want to do it all by myself. I, I love the community effort. So I brought in, um, because a Paz Girl was so personal, um, I wanted to bring in an assistant director, which was Carmelita Maldonado, another wonderful playwright as well. And um, I brought in Santi Samano, who's part of the ensemble of Breath of Fire uh, as a technical director. And then it was also very collaborative. The actors were really up for the challenge as well. Only one or two of them had done something on Zoom, but everyone else was new. But, you know, I had some of them like, you know, at one point, some of them are crawling on the ground, you know, especially for El Arroyo. They would put their laptops on the floor. They would, you know, do all sorts of things just to add depth um, to the play. But um, I was really proud of, I'm involved with two projects in session one. We have session two and I directed or helped direct three pieces in section in session two. But um, I loved, I loved the uniqueness. I loved how each play um, did something different. Like Angela's, like it was filmed on location at a laundry mat. And you could tell that it was filmed to protect the actors, you know, but it still all worked. And then there's another one that by Joel with the high school students that I loved. They're just unique way of using camera and just suspending reality for a little bit. And because when we're on the stage, mm -hmm. we don't have all these things. It's not going to be perfect. So for me, it's just like you got to try. It may not be perfect, but, you know, you can't like wait to, for someone to do it for you. But you also can't be afraid to, to try or to mess up. It's just like um, Elena, who plays Amma in my play, she accidentally dropped her camera for one of the scenes and she just went with it, picked it up and she improved a line like, esta me colgo, and I loved it and it worked. I'm like, let's keep it. When you drop your camera, what would mom have on the by the keyboard? You know, and she of course is the vaporu and the cinta and her rosario. So I love that we still had that feeling of theater where Things are improvised. Things, you know, um, we you don't lose the quality. They still had to be off book. They still gave it their all. What are the themes you see in your work? What are the characters, the like, the stories that are attractive to you? So I'm a creative nonfiction writer. I guess that's one of my identities or how I identif um, identify. I write from personal experience, um, and so again, my writing has has a lot to do with um, dealing with personal problems or situation. The play at Buzz Girl, that conversation happened with my dad um, late one night and, um, and it stuck with me. And I remember writing the whole conversation down and um, I did leave right away to El Paso because um, that's where he moved back to. So my storytelling, you know, is definitely rooted in my family and my personal experience. A lot of my plays started off from a poem or from a short story that I wrote. This poem that I shared last night with um, Los Angeles Poet Society, it was called, um, uh, What Do You Do With Your Last $40? And it's a poem about like being laid off in the midst of COVID. But I remember just saying that line when I was pumping gas and being like, I have $40 till payday. <laughs> so the couple, how do I stretch these $40? And that line came to me and I didn't have, you know, anywhere to write, but I, I recorded it on the phone. And so I process things. I'm still that internal writer. I'm still that person that needs to, that my stories come from personal experience. And, and just, I've, I've learned, and it's, 
it's a hard skill. And I really appreciate that I'm really also getting into um, paying it forward and teaching creative writing classes now is helping to share your story, to share with detail and with honesty, because being a playwright and seeing people experience what you wrote or hearing them react, crying, laughing or whatnot, it's been a blessing because not just as a writer to feel like good about what you did, but to know you're not alone with all that pain. You're not alone with the things that you have to face. Like it sucks right now, you know, but it's amazing to feel connection to um, to make community with other writers and artists or people who never thought that they could be a writer. And, you know, with these classes, there's so many writers that I admire or and they're so new. They're like, I've never written a poem before. or I've never written a short story before. And I'm all like, it sounds like they've been writing their whole lives. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the magic. And I think you see that a lot in these workshops. And yeah, it's like, where have you been? Like, yeah. And that's what I get from your podcast. I love La Lista. I love that, you know, I delve into like these writers and I'm hearing their stories. And it sounds like a little bit like my story and that they're just so raw and open about their lives um, is just beautiful because you don't feel alone. You're in your car driving. You know, it's, it's a lot of times when I'm listening to it and you feel connected to this larger community. And, and just thank you so much for that, Ruben. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm just taking the inspiration y'all gave me, you know, Yeah. I'm, and just try to pay it back. The whole reason I started this podcast was because I saw <laughs> all the talented people in Boyle Heights and I was like, uh, hello, we need to, t like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, you are definitely like one of the pillars of this community. Like, oh, thank you. You Like, you deserve all the love, all the cash, like all the praise because, because yeah, it's, you're someone I definitely admire as a, as a playwright, as a creative, as a writer. And, oh, thank you. and I'm trying to make sure you get paid. I'm trying to make sure oh, you- Oh, thank you. I'm trying to make sure to get paid too, because now I'm trying to do this full time. Now that I'm unemployed, <laughs> I'm like, okay, Alvia, what are you going to do with this? And when I got laid off from the Orange County Human Relations, I was in a deep depression. You know, it's hard for me to- Now, it was like the best thing that happened to me. I have not looked back. I do not want to go back. I loved and appreciate all the work that I created, but I feel like now it's my time. And, and now it's like, I got to get, write those books. I want to keep teaching. I love, I love teaching um, creative writing. I feel like I really come alive to there, but for me, that's paying it back. Mm -hmm. I read all the classes that I have been, been involved in all the books. I love, I have a lot of, you know, admirers of books that I read, but I read a lot on writing because I want to hear kind of like La Lista. I want to hear people's story. But yeah, I definitely want also, I also need to eat and have a roof over my head. So wish me luck, y'all. <laughs> Listen, I'm saying it here. If you're, if you're trying to tell the Chicana story, like th there's only one person in my mind to go to, and that's you. Don't make me cry, dude. <laughs> Ruben has, um, I mean, Vizca, you know, has also been saying that he's all like, you need to make these features. You need to write the three Chicana stories, you know, because I write a lot about my sisters as well. But yeah, I'm definitely, that's what I'm working on now. I'm not, I want to work on a collection of poetry. I'm working on a collection of my short plays. Um, Angela and I were talking one day and she brought something up and I'm like, oh, I wrote a play about that. Oh yeah, I wrote a play about that. She's like, you should just call it that. I wrote a play about that. <laughs> Like, I, I'm a very, I'm not perfect. I'm a flawed person. And so before anybody can dish out dirt about me, I probably wrote a play or a poem about it. You know, I'm the first one not to talk bad about myself, but be like, we're human. You know, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I, and you are definitely a leader and a fire keeper as well. Um, so, you know, speaking of people we admire, who are some of the writers that you admire? These could be heroes, peers, friends of yours, people you creep on Instagram, who may not know who you are, but you're obsessed with their work. So who are some of those people for you? Growing up, I read a lot of Black and African American writers because there wasn't a lot of Chicano Latino writers out there. So I definitely grew up with like um, reading, you know, Alice Walker, you know, um, Bell Hooks and things and people like that. But um, Shari Moraga, um, Gloria Saldua, definitely, um, Sandra Cisneros, Ana Castillo, definitely, you know, just really um, exploded my my head. And a good friend of mine, Adriana Alba, was the one that introduced me to some of these writers and shoved these books in my hands. And, you know, 
Um, but now it's, you know, I have Araceli Gourmet, of course, Jessica Salgado, all the writers from CCC, just every year, like their writing is just, you know, it's so on point. I love different um, people and um, communities like Sunday Jump, the people in Sunday Jump, it's a Filipino um, spoken word group. Um, Mujeres Amayis, I've been involved with some of their, um, some of their zines, and they have um, a wonderful um, art um, group from there. Lorena Ortega is a wonderful storyteller. She's part of CCC. My sister, she's a wonderful playwright, but her poetry is just so raw and beautiful. There's a new writer. Uh, they've been writing, but the writers from our writing group, uh, Rio de Mi Vida writers, amazing, amazing new stuff where it's just like, I feel like I'm opening a book each week. But one of them that I'm really excited about is um, Guido Mendoza. Um, please keep an eye on them. Their, their writing is just really phenomenal. And I have other writing friends that don't want to share their work, but are so amazing. And so for me, it's a lot of people ha who you haven't even heard of, but out of respect, you know, until they're ready to explode out into the world, I'll be here to support them, to help them do that. But but yeah, I'm just really, just shout out to Rio de Mi Vida writers. Um, keep writing and, um, and yeah, I'm excited for people. We're gonna do a showcase hopefully in the end of February. So we'll um, keep you posted so you can hear some of this work. Don't stop writing. Don't feel like it has to be perfect. Um, I really feel like, and there's people out there who will support you. And don't listen to the naysayers. I had a lot of naysayers when I got involved with theater. They're like, oh, you know, what's this about? Or, oh, is this your new hobby? And if I listened to them, I would have stopped. And now some of these naysayers are like, oh, what are you going to write about next? Are you going to write about me next? Or, what? you know, what's the topic? So I know it's hard to, like, you know, to listen to your inner critic or the people that are around you. But as long as you believe in your own work. But at the same time, it's not just about writing, but about revising and editing. So you have to put the work in it, too. But, yeah, definitely there's circles and and people out there that are here to support you. Find those classes. A lot of them are free. The one we're going to teach with Breath of Fire is free. Um, the one that we're just wrapping up with Boyle Heights Neighborhood Council, that one's free. I really appreciate. I hope organizations continue to support artists and pay them to teach these classes and so that they can be open for the community because there's a lot of um, emotions and a lot of um, feelings out there and people are trying to write their stories. And I hope we continue to create spaces like this, like La Lista, where uh, people can continue to do that. And so where can people follow you on social media? <laughs> um, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Chicana Chingona. That was a college nickname that kind of stuck. And on uh, Facebook, I'm at um, Elvia Rubalcaba. I have a website. It's elviasusana.com because my last name gets butchered a lot. So <laughs> I figured let's make it simple. But yeah, I, I share a lot. I do uh, I do a CCC writes and I put up writing prompts. Um, I try and do it weekly. So um, please follow me. Yeah, and I've met a ton of writers and poets, like not physically, but just virtually by sharing each other's work. You know, there's a lot of people I creep on, you know, other poets and stuff. But and that's how I met them. Just keep digging. Follow those those hashtags, you know. So I like to ask my guests to help me title the podcast episode. So the prompt is a blank Latinx writer. And you can put as many words as you want. You can mix them all around. Just whatever feels true to you, your story, your writing, this conversation. I also use it as a community building tool. So if someone sees that and they're like, oh, that person's like me, I should listen. I should reach out. Um, so what do you got? My friend, um, Dr. Lavi, one time told me, like, you are un unapologetically Chicana. And I, that kind of, you know, has really stayed in my head. But I also highlight and am proud of my flaws. So I want to say un unapologetically flawed Chicana writer. <laughs> Dreamer, writer. <laughs> However you want to put it. <laughs> so that's, that'll be my job to figure out. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, perfect. I love it. So with that, I do want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. Again, this was long overdue, and I'm so glad I finally got to get